Hey everyone, welcome back to our video series on the different treatment options that are available for kidney stones. Today's topic of conversation is percutaneous nephrolithotomy or PCNL. Today we're going to talk about the different treatment details. We'll also take a look at the American Urological Association's patient selection criteria and we'll investigate the success rates of this procedure. Now, if you're looking for all this information in a lot more detail in a written format, I would encourage you to check out our education blog on our website. There you will find all this information in long form content uh, format that you will probably be more easily able to digest versus trying to listen to me in this video. So check that out. The link is down in our description. Now, before I forget, I'd also like to invite you to hit the subscribe button down in the bottom right hand corner. By doing this, this helps the algorithm find additional people who are suffering from kidney stones like you and me and gives them access to the information that they need. Now, without further ado, let's dive in. So, in terms of the treatment itself, I'm going to walk through this pretty much step by step just to give you a better idea of what is really involved in this particular surgical modality because it is one of the most complicated that we've seen thus far. So, when it comes to percutaneous nephrolithotomy, I just want to take a second and just just define what this means. So we're going to break apart percutaneous nephrolithotomy to be able to better understand really what is involved in this modality. So when it comes to this, percutaneous is, when you look up the definition, it is of through or around the skin. And nephro is related to kidneys and lithotomy has to do with removal of stones or calculi from the body. So when you put it all together, it is literally stone removal through the skin and out of the body. <laughs> so putting all together, percutaneous nephrolithotomy kind of makes more sense. Through the skin, removal of the stone and the kidney. Now, in order to get this accomplished, the first thing that needs to be done is there needs to be a puncture made through your skin and into the calyx of the kidney that is closest to the stone. Now, when it comes to puncture techniques, we're gonna investigate this a little further when we talk about success rates, but the actual approach that the surgeon uses uh, will really highly dictate the overall success rate of that procedure. But nevertheless, we're gonna make a puncture into your side, through your skin, and into the kidney. Now, in order to do this appropriately, we need to have visualization and guidance of the kidney stone so that we can get that needle into the place that it needs to be and not cause any potential damage to the surrounding organs or muscular skeletal um, structure that surrounds the kidney. That can cause some pretty severe complications. So in order to get that right, we're gonna use guidance that is gonna be either accomplished through fluoroscopy, which is involving um, multiple, it's kind of live time x-rays that are being taken. And because of that, it involves radiation. So you have to be a little bit cognizant of that when we're uh, considering PCNL, because typically fluoroscopy is the guidance of choice for surgeons, just because it's pretty much widespread availability all throughout the world. And it is what most surgeons are comfortable with using. However, there are options that are available for using ultrasound, CT, or even ureteroscopy to be able to go up and visualize that puncture of the needle coming through the skin and into the kidney. Next, once we have that puncture made, we need to dilate that tract to be able to uh, make room for the different instruments that are gonna be used to be able to attack that kidney stone. So traditionally, when we're talking about dilating or widening this tract, they used something called sheaths. And basically, if you envision this, they are just long pieces of material and they start to get progressively wider. So you'll insert one and then you'll insert another. And over the course of time, you are slowly widening that opening of the skin and into the kidney to be able to allow access for those tools. More recently though, a lot of surgeons have migrated over to balloon dilation. So in essence, what this does, instead of inserting successively larger sheaths, they insert a little device and then there is a inflation bladder on that balloon that inflates over time slowly to get the access width that the surgeon desires. Now, 
When it comes to that width, this is really a topic of a lot of the evolution around percutaneous nephrolithotomy. So conventional percutaneous nephrolithotomy uses an access tract that is a size of 24 to 30 French. And you probably are going, what the heck is a French? It's not something that I was familiar with when I first started investigating this, but it's actually a pretty common sense system. So in essence, if you're taking a look at a circle, the French system takes a point and then measures all the way around the circumference of that circle in millimeters in order to get this figure here. So 24 or 30, let's just use 30. So 30 French literally means that circle is 30 millimeters in circumference. Some terms that are more relatable for us, a 24 to 30 French opening means eight to 10 millimeters in diameter, which is a big hole. That's a centimeter size hole in your side and in your kidney, um, which is a little bit disconcerting. Nevertheless, that is what has driven a lot of the evolution that we see with this particular surgical modality. So mini perk or miniaturized percutaneous nephrolithotomy had been developed to be able to address this. So mini perk uses 14 to 20 French or 4.7 to 6.7 millimeters in diameter. So roughly half the size of the access tract of the conventional PCNL procedure. There's also something called MicroPerk, which is developed in the pediatric scene for treating children with kidney stones. This is a 4.85 French or a 1.62 millimeter diameter access. And that is tiny, tiny. But one of the things that they found is technology has evolved and time has gone on and they've figured out how to master getting smaller and smaller devices is that complication rates go down pretty considerably, uh, in particular with regards to bleeding. However, this surgical modality is really kind of honed in on larger or more complex kidney stones. So the smaller the access tract size, the more limited the surgeon becomes in actually removing or treating those kidney stones. So there's a little bit of a trade-off that is occurring with the reduction of the size of the access tract. Uh, in comparison to the actual performance or the, I guess, what do I want to call it? The ability of the surgeon to articulate and manipulate the different devices within your kidney. Now, when it comes to actually attacking the stone to get it out of your system, just like when we were talking about the puncture, visualization is really critical because the surgeon needs to be able to see what they're doing or what they're acting on before they take action. So. Traditionally, a nephroscope is used, and these are typically rigid. So this is going to go into the side of your, uh, into the side here of your skin and into the kidney, and that is going to provide access and visualization for the surgeon while they're inserting different tools to be able to address that stone. The other option is to use a ureteroscope, which is like we talked about with ureteroscopy, but they're going to go up through your urethra, into your bladder, into the ureter, and then to wherever that stone is so they can lay eyes on it. Now, the next part of this is with regards to removal. And you would think that it would be a little bit more sophisticated than this, but really what they're doing is they're poking a hole in your side, and then they're going to go in and they're going to remove those stones with graspers. Now, they'll use a grasper or a stone basket for stones that are smaller than the access tract size. So if we go in and let's just say they use PCNL for a very small kidney stone, just for this example. Let's say they've got a six millimeter kidney stone and they've gone with conventional uh, access tract size of eight to 10 millimeters, we can probably remove that stone just straight out of the access tract. But for most larger stones, which again was what this surgical modality is really intended for, we're gonna need to break apart those stones or fragment them just like we would with ureteroscopy. So the devices are different. They're still technically termed as lithotriptors. However, there are a whole host of different ones than they would use in ureteroscopy. Now, with these variations, every urological center or hospital is probably gonna vary because of their financial situation or their just surgical preference. So you'll see a wide array here, but in essence, they're just breaking apart the stones to be able to get them into smaller fragment sizes so they can then remove them with that same stone basket or the grasper. Now, 
complications. I was actually surprised when I took a look at the actual complication rate for this particular surgery because it is the most invasive of all of the different modalities that we've talked about so far. However, only about 15% of patients are going to see issues, which for a surgery, I think is a relatively low complication rate. Most often are you going to see bleeding and infection. So those two things are really what surgeons are hyper-focused on preventing uh, when they have a PCNL patient on their table. Now, the last thing is with regards to cost. And this particular surgical modality is extremely expensive. Took a look around and we found the average procedure cost in the United States as of the filming of this video in 2022 to be about $30,000 per procedure. Now, this is going to vary probably about plus or minus five to seven thousand dollars, depending upon where you are in the country, what hospitals you're going to, what kind of insurance that you have. But again, the average that we're looking at is thirty thousand dollars. Now, concerning is that just like with ureteroscopy, they're likely going to need multiple staged procedures in order to fully clear complex or large kidney stone burdens, which again, I've said this probably about three times now, that's what this surgical modality is for, large complex stones. So it's unlikely that you're gonna get all your stones removed in just one procedure. It will likely be over the course of two or three staged procedures. Unfortunately, that ticks up the cost pretty considerably. And you can be knocking on the door of 60 to $100,000 pretty quickly. Hopefully, the success rate is high. <laughs> but before we get to that, let's talk about who is the correct patient really for PCNL procedures. Now, the American Urological Association says that for stones located in the ureter, this is not a first-line modality. This is not something that should be considered unless shockwave lithotripsy or ureteroscopy has failed, and this is kind of a last-ditch effort um, in trying to avoid an open surgery, uh, which is the most invasive out of all surgical techniques. So, not for stones in the ureter, unless all those other modalities fail. Where this really shines, again, is with stones located in the kidney that are large. And large is about 20 millimeters, which is two centimeters, or bigger. And yes, stones can get bigger than that. I've seen three, four, five, six, seven, eight millimeter size, or I'm sorry, centimeter size stones. So they can get pretty large. And again, this procedure is really what it is meant for. Now, when it comes to success rates, we had talked about this a little bit earlier about the access tract really driving a lot of the success rate because the approach really dictates the ability for the surgeon to articulate the different tools within the kidney to be able to get to the stone. So when we're assessing the success rates, we've broken it out by either superior access, which means if you're visualizing the kidney, the surgeon is coming from the top down into the calyces to be able to have pretty much unlimited field of vision and range of movement for the tools, or there is traditionally the inferior axis. And the inferior axis is by and large what most surgeons are comfortable using. And an inferior axis is either access through the lower part of the kidney, or also you can go through the mid part of the kidney as well, depending upon where that stone is located. However, as you'll see here in these results, inferior access provides inferior art articulation ability. So surgeons are going to be very, very limited in the field of motion or range of motion that they can articulate their tools to be able to get into the different calyces to attack kidney stones. So when it comes to location, again, it's all focused on in the kidney. So we're going to take a look at stones that are either in the renal pelvis, which is just outside the kidney, not quite into the ureter, in the kidney, and then there's also a combination. So let's say you've got a stone that's actively about to pass, it's in the renal pelvis, and you got some other stones that are located in your kidney. The surgeon's gonna to try to attack all those to remove them at one shot or over the course of a couple stage procedures. Now, when it comes to success, 98.5% of the time, superior access for renal pelvis stones, we got 100% stone clearance. 92.5% in the inferior case, so just a little bit lower, but not terrible. When it comes to stones in the kidney, 
this is where things start to separate out. So 95.7% of the time, superior access for treating stones in the kidney received clearance. However, about a 13% drop based on inferior access. With stones that are located in both in the pelvis and in the kidney as well, superior access, again, because of this excellent ability to maneuver within the kidney, looking at 94.8%. And then in the inferior access, it's down to 81.9%. So a very significant drop. But again, this all has to do with the ability for the surgeon to manipulate their tools within the kidney. So I hope that all of this makes sense. We've certainly covered a lot of information across all these different videos that we've put together on the different treatment options available for kidney stones. And to help make things easier to understand, we have assembled a very, very easy to use guide that can help you understand these procedures better and how your urologist is arriving at the recommendation that they're making for how to treat your kidney stone. So if you're interested, check it out at www.stone-relief.com slash pages slash procedures. From there, enter your name, your email address, and we will send you that PDF as quickly as we possibly can. Thank you all for tuning in. Please leave any questions or comments below, and we will see you again in the next video. Thank you, everyone.